chair of the psychology department here at Grand Rapids Community College. It's my honor today to be interviewing Dr. John Cacciapio. Uh, Dr. Cacciapio is, uh, is a professor of psychology at the University of Chicago and a scholar well known within uh, the realm of psychology. So it's my honor to be interviewing him today. Welcome. Thank you. I want to begin by creating a, a broad framework before we get to the specifics of your conversation today. Um, could you describe sort of the basic pre pre tenets of social neuro neuropsychology? Sure. Um, it's, it's an approach to study brain function. Um, it's really the study of the neural, hormonal, cellular, and molecular, including genetic mechanisms underlying the superorganismal structures and processes that define social species. Social species are unique because they have sufficiently reliable interactions that structures and relationships can be identified, like mother-infant attachment and pair bonds. And then it's what are the neural, hormonal, cellular, and molecular mechanisms that underlie that? How does the social structure and processes, how does culture then modify the genome itself over generations? That's what social neuroscience deals with. I'm always curious with any scientist the sort of the, the path that, that takes somebody to, to study one area versus something else, since there's just essentially an infinite number of studies. You began as sort of a traditional social psychologist. What brought you to uh, really inventing a new perspective, a, a new way of thinking about being human? So what's not known widely is that I did training in both bio and in social. And so Although you may know me as a social psychologist early in my career, I had another career that was parallel in biopsychology. I've been on, in the faculty in both areas throughout most of my career. Uh, when I went up for tenure, they had biopsychologists and social psychologists independently review the relevant part of the record. And kind of the general comment was, we don't even know about the other side. And so what I was trying to do was ultimately to bring those two perspectives together. When I started, combining social and biological was not at all a popular thing to be doing. But it struck me as important if we wanted comprehensive explanations of behavior, especially interesting behavior, social behaviors, we couldn't settle for just the focus on the situation and we couldn't settle for just the focus on the biologic. We had to look at how the two interacted. That's basically how I started, and it took me about 20 years to articulate well enough um, how to go about bridging that abyss, uh, and I published a series of American psychologist articles starting with inferring the psychological significance of physiological signals in 1990 that started to lay out that mathematical foundation. And the 92 paper where I proposed social neuroscience, that was really building on what we had done over the last 20 plus years. So where does social neuroscience fit in this broad spectrum of, of uh, schools of thought and perspectives and different research areas? It really is an interdisciplinary field. So it, you know, it includes uh, ev evolutionary biology, um, anthropology, uh, psychology. I mean, psychology, as you well appreciate, is an interdisciplinary field within itself. Clinical, bio, social, developmental, all very important, very distinctive perspectives, cognitive, and so we're looking at all of those perspectives. In fact, I teach intro, and one of the things I do to show how it takes all of the perspectives to understand something is every chapter I go through the research on loneliness from that particular perspective to show how no single perspective has the total answer. You need all of them together. So it's very interdisciplinary perspective. There's animal research as well as human research and patient research. Um, and that really uh, acts as uh, a kind of a synergism to give us deeper insights into the phenomena that uh, we're interested in, that is brain function. You had mentioned earlier the, the evolutionary psychology, mm -hmm. and could you talk a bit on this, uh, the evolutionary perspective of the need to be social? Sure. So uh, actually what I mentioned was evolutionary biology, which okay. is slightly different. Um, but if you look at evolutionary biology, They'll talk about four ways to categorize social behaviors. Um, mutual benefit, selfishness, altruism, and spite. And what differs is to what extent does the behavior have a benefit for me, uh, an evolutionary benefit, to what extent does it have an evolutionary cost to me but benefit to you. And so mutual benefit is uh, like uh, hunters, uh, now able to go after large game uh, because 
to take down a mastodon is impossible as an individual. If you have a group, uh, you can do that. Uh, and the mastodon's meat will spoil before any single individual can uh, eat it all, consume it. So it's to our mutual benefit to work together to take down that large mammal, and then we all have food that helps us survive. That's the example of mutual benefit. Altruism, I do something for you. Evolutionary biologists have been puzzled. Why would we ever do that? Charles Darwin questioned, why would we ever do that in the sense of man? But notice that it was done, curiously enough. And the, uh, the argument that's come out of evolutionary biology is it's to your genetic benefit to do so when the genetic relatedness of those who benefit from the behavior offsets the cost to you. So, um, so that's why one might do that. Selfishness is what you see in non-social animals and in social animals in many circumstances. That's when it's to my benefit and your detriment, I end up the winner. Well, being the winner is not a bad thing in evolutionary biological senses. Spite is when it costs you and me. Punitive altruism is an instance of spite. Uh, and the argument there is when it's to my benefit to change your behavior by forcing you to incur a cost greater than I'm incurring, then I can shape your behavior into something that's more likely to produce mutual benefit or a selfish benefit to myself. The other version of that is, is again, genetic relatedness. If by stopping you, I may go to a cost, but my relatives, many of them, survive then and wouldn't have if I had let you continue, then it's actually to my genetic benefit, fitness, to, to uh, engage in that behavior. So spite, too, has kind of the same genetically selfish motivation, but not individually selfish. So is being social not an, is, is being social just non-optional for being human? It is hardwired into how we've evolved into who we are today. So uh, that's a great question. There, um, there is a genetic, depending on which phenotype you're talking about, um, the the tendency to want to have a relationship with others. It's salutary. That there's a genetic substrate to that. It's about fifty percent heritable from behavioral genetics. It's about 14% uh, percent chip heritability, which means additive effects from common variants of the genes. And that tendency means that, not that it's genetic, but that the individual differences are genetic. So there are some people on the extreme that don't have that tendency at all. They have no compunction uh, to just do things that are for themselves, to exploit relationships. Um, and I've talked to a number of clinical psychologists whose expertise is uh, uh, sociopathy, psychopathy, and that seems to characterize those individuals. At the other extreme are individuals who are so pained by uh, the thought of disconnection that they're all dysfunctional. So we have clinical problems at both extremes, but in the, in the more normal part of that distribution, what you see are people who are pained by the thought of disconnection, so they're willing to stand in front of the gates of the village and fend off attackers. At the other end, there are people who are not so pained by at least temporary disconnection, that they're willing to go over the hill and the hill after that to explore, but have some compunction to return to those relationships so they bring back the gifts that they found while exploring. And so that kind of variability uh, has continued, and as you can see, it's adapted for the group to have that variability. The need to be social has been argued philosophically for mm -hmm. as long as human beings were arguing. Um, for the most part, uh, psychology has accepted it, um, certainly some areas within the discipline more than others. Um, but, but those have been either through philosophical argument or through planned social experiments. Has your field in using, bringing biology to it, has it provided a, even a, a more comprehensive argument that this need to be social is innate? Yes, and, and again, there isn't a single phenotype that makes us social. Um, so if we look at need for affiliation or we need uh, or, uh, the pain at being isolated from others or our gregariousness or extroversion, those are all distinct, functionally and statistically distinct phenotypes. But they all have to do with our sociality. And in each case, when you look at it from a population level, having variability is good for the population. And so those tendencies then make us in turn we're going to vary exactly how much of each of those phenotypes. Now, the one that I've focused on is how painful is it to be feel isolated? Not to be isolated, but to feel isolated. You can feel isolated in a crowd. 
And that has uh, uh, such a strong effect on our mortality. It accounts for a 26% increase in premature mortality, independent of demographics, whether you're actually isolated or not, and even when controlling for a variety of these other phenotypes like extroversion or neuroticism. Again, my own curiosity, um, what brought you to study loneliness? What was... That's a, that's a, I'm glad you asked that because I didn't know I was studying loneliness when I started. Uh, when, I, when I outlined social neuroscience as a potential field and argued for its benefit, um, that was based on you know, kind of the mathematics and the philosophical argument. Um, what I realized, my own research at that time was actually on more evaluative affective, the structure of the brain, how it re-represented functions having to do with distinguishing hostile from hospitable stimuli. That's actually what my research was on at that point in time. Uh, when I laid that out, I realized that the best, you know, these arguments are necessary. They're not going to be sufficient. People like to see successful scientific questions in the field, and then it's easier for them to follow. So the most critical dimension of being a social animal, any social species, are these connections. And so I thought, well, let's look at the degrees of connection. I mean, if we want to know what the orbital frontal cortex does, we look at Phineas Gage before and after he lost that front, frontal cortex from an, an accident as a railroad worker, as you know. If we want to know what a gene does, we create a knockout mouse that's genetically the same except for the absence of that gene. No one's actually interested in the hold in Phineas's gauges head or the absence of the gene. They're interested in the difference so they can understand what that gene or that cortex did. So by studying individuals without these connections or with a deficit in the connections, I was better able to see how important were these connections to health, well-being, cognitive functioning, social functioning. And so that's why I actually started studying objective and perceived isolation. Now, social epidemiologists had studied objective isolation. Of course, we as psychologists know that for the most part, the objective world isn't as important as the perceived world. So I studied objective and perceived social isolation. And as we suspected, perceived social isolation turned out to be incredibly important to brain and biology and to social functioning. I was also uh, uh, informed shortly after that that perceived social isolation is called loneliness. So I actually found I was studying loneliness kind of after the fact. And truthfully, I almost stopped studying it because I wasn't sure I wanted to be a loneliness doctor. But in fact, it turned out to be much more powerful than any of us ever imagined. And so we kept studying it because it was so informative. And as I suggested, We've continued now for more than a quarter century simply because of the information that we continue to learn from the study just across various domains. It's much more central. It's like pain. It's temporary, it's ancient, and it's incredibly powerful when it's in force. Could you elaborate on, on the idea of, of subjective? Because obviously loneliness, if you're on an island by yourself, that's we can measure those attributes. but. It's, it's the individual that defines whether they're lonely or not. Right. So we, if you ask people, do they feel lonely, um, depending on their culture and their socialization, they will underreport. Uh, so scales have been developed that allow you to tap whether someone feels isolated without ever using the word lonely or loneliness. Those are the better scales, and they're the most commonly used around the world. When you look at what exactly these scales are capturing, there's three dimensions. Uh, one is uh, intimate relatedness or connection, and that's the extent to which there's someone in the world who affirms you have value. Marital status is the best predictor, but by no means does it guarantee that, and it, it isn't necessary, but someone who affirms you have value. The second is relational connectedness, and that's the extent to which others, friends, and family are there when you need them. They form these salutary relationships, healthy relationships. Uh, and that's what people usually think of when they think of loneliness. The third is collective connectedness. And people are really very aware of that, uh, but it's the extent to which you feel like you belong to a group and that group values you. So if you recall, uh, right after 
um, Americans, strangers in America, were treating each other so well that it made national news. When the Olympics were in Great Britain and the Brits were doing better than expected, what made the news was the Brits in the pubs, who didn't know each other, were high-fiving and acting like they were long-term friends. Not typical British behavior. That's the power of collective identity. Each of those has a different evolutionary basis. As you can imagine, the cinnamon, pair bonding, mother-infant, father-infant attachment processes, uh, the relational, the formation of families and collectives, the collective, the recognition and treatment of someone who looks like they're in your in-group without knowing that person, without the social recognition that's necessary for the other two kinds of connection. So all three of those, you can see their evolutionary benefits, if you will, in terms of finding the people with whom you can engage in mutual benefit. It's, it's costly to you if you think you can trust someone and they turn out not to be trustworthy. The, that they become exploitive of you, and that's that's very bad. That can be fatal, and so um, we don't tend to retreat into selfishness when we feel like we can we have those healthy relationships with others. You're describing really a kind of species specific behavior. The, the the issue of the need to connect and relationships. Are have you been able to see do these differences manifest? differently in different ways across different cultures, a collectivist versus an individualistic culture as an example. Yes, we have in fact looked at that. Um, this structure that I mentioned is the same across cultures. It's true in young, it's true in old, it's true in Western cultures, it's true in Eastern. We even tested it in China and the young and old generations there are very different cultures. The single child uh, um, rule over the last 30 years has changed that culture in China. So we tested both pre-rule and, and since, and we find the same structure. There's a slightly different interpretation of some of the words. Family means something different in China than it does in the United States, uh, but we find the same structure. The cultural differences we do see and the gender differences we do see, age-related, is exactly the, uh, at the operational, not at the conceptual level. So the same kinds of predictors exist, but what that means will differ. And you see that with what is rewarding, just simple rewards. What's rewarding to a child is not the same thing as rewarding to a young adult or to an older adult. So that's where we see the differences. But at the conceptual level, we see very few cultural differences. The one minor difference, and it surprised me at first, is that we find loneliness to be higher in interdependent cultures than in independent cultures. Now, that might strike you as non-obvious at well as well. Let me just ask you a quick question. When do you think loneliness is highest in the United States? What time of year? Uh, the holidays. Yes, and that's absolutely right. And it also illustrates why it's higher in collective cultures. During the holidays, it is the cultural norm that you're sharing times with family and friends and having a great time. That isn't always the case. And when you're not, it's especially painful. So in cultures that are more interdependent, like Italy, in contrast to, for instance, the Scandinavian countries, that, that norm exists every day. And so if you are feeling lonely, it's more painful. It may not be as frequent, it may not last as long, but it's more painful when you do simply because it's so counter-normative. So we're still dealing with then, the cultural norms create the expectations, which allows us to subjectively determine how many people should I have or how many, I think of the research on happiness, which suggests yeah. if you create unrealistic expectations about happiness, people are actually less happy. Right. Um, so we right. see the same thing. You can't define loneliness outside of the social context. Not exactly. So one of the things that we have found in studying loneliness is that the phenomenology is largely misleading. So it's clearly aversive. But we have a lot of notions about what loneliness is and how to fix it. Those common sense notions turn out to be wrong. And the reason they're wrong is this is a phylogenetically really old social process. We see it in fruit. Fruit flies die earlier when they're isolated from other fruit flies. We see the same kinds of mechanisms operating in rodents, in fish. It isn't that it evolved so really It's evolved repeatedly across different species. 
And those in mammalian species, we, we show those same functions. And we're unaware. Those are so old, we're unaware of those processes. And so there are certain bounds. So, for instance, digital connection, we have been told, brings us together. That's a different kind. Well, they don't actually replace face-to-face -face relationships. We just published a review of this literature. It's um, very much uh, a tool. If you use those digital connections to, to promote face-to-face -face interactions, you get less lonely. If you use it to replace face-to-face -face interactions, you get more lonely. The cultural norm is that you would get less lonely. That belief doesn't make it true. So there is still certain fundamental needs, like to be with others. The child who falls and hurts his knees, seeing a parent on Skype doesn't suffice. Just there, some things aren't replaceable, even though we have the expectation that they should be. There is a, a, a practical application here and a practical question then, since we've started down the road of social media and, and technological interaction, is there some <coughs> rubric or tipping point or, or sense of interaction where it becomes uh, <coughs> problematic, but really just through happenstance? It, young people today are using the technology so frequently. Yeah. Uh, you, can, you can see four college students sitting at the same table and they're all on their phones versus interacting with each other. Right. Uh, it's not to suggest they don't interact with each other, they may not. Is, is, is there some way to understand when that becomes problematic? Well, well we've, we've actually asked whether there's a threshold. I've, I've looked at that question for more than 20 years. There are very, very few thresholds in this effect. Um, the, when you look at the, the extent to which you have or feel connected, it pretty much is a continuum. That's true in mortality. That's true in, in neural activity that we see in the brain, uh, uh, inflammatory activity that we see in the immune system, uh, your susceptibility to viruses across measures. We see it as a continuum, not as a threshold. So there doesn't seem to be that. Um, and it's reasonable to ask, well, how do you know it's causal? Because most of the literature on the social network use is, is correlational. There is a little bit of experimental work, and that's consistent with what I said. And the other thing that we see is when someone, so most kids, most young adults are using social networking to leverage face-to-face -face interactions, not all of them. When they become lonely, they're more likely to abandon the face-to-face and start using it as a substitute, and that makes it worse. And of course, the reason they do that is one of the things loneliness does is to make you dubious about potential threats from other people because you don't trust them as much. It makes you want to reconnect, but it also creates a conflicting motivation that you're less aware of that sees them as a threat. That's something that the brain does that we actually don't articulate, but we see it in brain activity and baseline in response to tasks. We see it in a variety of behavioral measures. Do you then see a, a, a cycle that leads towards loneliness? Mm -hmm. like one of the things we just found was a, a hypothesis. We tested a hypothesis that came out of the, the approach, this evolutionary approach, and that is that if I fall from looking at others as mutual benefit to not having that benefit, the equation changes and you fall into selfishness. That becomes your default. So that's self-promotion. Now, we see that in other animals. When an animal gets attacked in a herd, the other animals run. Well, that's going from mutual benefit to selfish, right? And so we also do that. If we can't trust other animals to help defend us, we go to a selfish mode and we retreat. We see that in brain scanning. If I show a negative social image, most people show activity that suggests empathy. Lonely individuals, when it's negative, controlling for just negative non-social, so the affect is being controlled for, we see greater visual activity. That is, if something negative, they pay attention because they don't have defense. And then when, as you follow that visual stream forward, you get to the uh, temporal parietal junction, which is an area of the brain responsible for perspective taking, empathy, theory of mind. Lonely individuals show less activity there because they're focused on themselves, not on the afflicted, because the afflicted is simply a sign that they too could be next. And, and so they fall into this selfishness. Now, if that's the case, then they may not be able to tell us what their brain is telling us, 
but we should see them become more selfish over time. I started a longitudinal population-based study in Crook County in 2001. We have 10 years worth of longitudinal data from that study. I looked at this question over those 10 years, and sure enough, from cross-lag panel analyses, from longitudinal analyses using covariates to control for alternative interpretations, we found that the lonelier they became, the more self-centered they became. If they retreated from loneliness, that is, it went down and they became less lonely, their self-centeredness went down. Self-centeredness had an effect on loneliness as well. It was about half the effect size, but not too surprisingly. If I'm acting selfish, you're less likely to form a, a healthy relationship with me. And so that told us of, of an antecedent no, none of us had anticipated, and that is, and, an, and a vector by which to perhaps treat it, and that is to work on their seeing others, testing to make sure they're safe, and then treating them in a safe fashion rather than acting only in their own self-interest. And that should then decrease the difficulties they find in getting out of that selfish, lonely state. I want to come back to some of the, because I know you have uh, developed some tools, techniques to, to, to move out of loneliness, but a concept that I, I find interesting is the whole idea that loneliness is contagious. Yes. So th that's something that we actually found um, in the Framingham study. We looked across time uh, and we uh, wanted to make sure it wasn't homophily or common outcomes. Those are alternative interpretations. We ruled those out and we found that it was uh, true that it was contagious, but it required interactions. And so we did a, an experience sampling methodology study to see what was going on when lonely individuals interacted with friends uh, and, and confidants that would lead them to become less lonely. So it was interesting because we found not the ones on the edge to be lonely of the social networks, it was when they became lonely, they moved to the edge of these social network structures. And what we found from the experience sampling methodology is lonely individuals are more likely to see negative interactions and they're likely to help produce more negative social interactions. If I expect you to be aggressive, I'm more likely to act aggressively toward you in defense, and of course, you're more likely to interact with me. So indeed, they had more negative social interactions. Those more negative social interactions were more intense. And if you have a negative social interaction, that makes you less likely to continue to be my friend, but it also means you're more likely to have a negative social interaction with someone else. That's not a probability of one, so the joint probability goes down after about four people. And so it is contagious. It's decreasingly so as you go across people, but it nevertheless can afflict those. And notice, you were my friend. You became not, you know, my negative behavior towards you made you no longer my friend and less likely to be someone else's, so you also ended up moving to the edge of the social network. So that's, that's the mechanism through which, it's a behavioral mechanism through which it's contagious. So what are some of the uh, consequences of being a lonely person? So there's, there's consequences on health, mental health, physical health, and on cognition. So we see it across those. Now, let me back up. Transient loneliness is why it evolved. It, you want physical pain to protect your physical body. You want loneliness to signal when your social relationships are starting to need repair or attention or replacement. And that's basically what loneliness, it's an aversive signal that takes this important part of your survival, instead of your physical body, it's your social body, which you also need as a social animal, and it says attend to that. So that's useful. The, the really deleterious effects come when it becomes chronic. And as we've become more global, as we've become more mobile across geographical boundaries and social boundaries, we don't have that safe long-term support mechanism around us. It's more fragile now. And so I can fall into a lonely state and it's harder for me to get out of it, especially because my intuitions about doing so tend not to be correct. And so I can fall into that and I don't have that loving group necessarily around me to help shield and walk me out of that state. And so that's, that's why these chronic effects. Now, what are some of these chronic effects? I mentioned earlier, it increases chances of premature mortality by 26%. It uh, decreases sleep quality. So people think that they, 
they sleep less long. We measured it. We put them in the hospital. We measured their sleep. Uh, nobody knew who was the lonely and non-lonely participants. They had more micro-awakenings. Uh, animal research has found the same thing. This has been found around the world. Uh, and it's uh, slow-wave sleep that gets sacrificed. That deep sleep that, that puts you in a particularly vulnerable position. I mean, from an evolutionary point of view, sleep is a dangerous state. Across human history and other species as well, the safety at night has come from sleeping groups. That's your safe social surround. But we've actually looked at this. If you feel lonely and your partner's in bed with you, but you feel lonely, the partner in bed with you doesn't increase sleep quality. You still show this because you don't have, your brain goes to sleep knowing that they don't have others around them they can trust for uh, defense during their sleep. And so that over a, a lifetime, you can imagine the wear and tear difference between somebody who sleeps well and somebody who's sleeping poorly every night. We've looked at longitudinal research. In the animal research, it's experimental. In the longitudinal research, we do the same kind of cross lag. Loneliness is leading to the sleep fragmentation. And we see it not only in undergraduates and in older adults, we even see it in uh, agrarian societies where they are very communal uh, and very farm-based. We see it in that population as well. So as a chronic problem, what are some of the things or some of the techniques that uh, you've discovered that uh, go against the myth of the myths, as you mentioned earlier, that, that what it takes to not be lonely? So if, if you will, allow me to speak about what some of those myths are about how to lower loneliness, because they, they're they so obvious and they're so common that I'd like to actually disabuse so people don't use what we've known, we now know not to be effective. The, the first is this confusion between loneliness and being alone. Uh, being alone does not make you lonely. Being alone when you don't want to be alone makes you lonely. So I'm sure you retreat when you're writing articles or books or preparing lectures. And uh, you know, most writers never find that to be lonely. Painters don't find it to be lonely because they're producing a piece of work that they're going to share with others. So that's actually a surprisingly social activity despite the fact you're alone because it's a social product that you're going to produce. Um, and indeed, studies where they put people together, like college freshmen and mixers, that, you know, all it does is to make those involved happy that they see others, unhappy that they don't have relationships with others. Moreover, lonely individuals have particularly bad interactions with other lonely individuals. And that, you know, that makes sense. If I, my brain is now looking for social threats. Your brain is looking for social threats. We're both going to interact in a more defensive, irritable fashion. It doesn't take long for that relationship to go south. And so these, these attempts, and it's been tried uh, in various countries who have been trying to deal with their country's loneliness. People say they like it. You've probably heard this in clinical psychology. They say they like it, but when you measure its effects, you, high, have, you see high rates of attrition, and it doesn't change the problem. And so that's, that's what we see from uh, uh, this putting people together called social engagement. Uh, social skills, and that comes from the work that shows kids with poor social skills tend to be more isolated and lonely. No argument there. However, when you look at a population, and we've been doing population-based research for a couple decades now, when you look at a population, the number of people who have poor social skills is a very small percentage. So it's not accounting for most of what we see in terms of loneliness. Teaching people social skills with that they already have doesn't really help. It. What's happening, though, is they're not using those social skills. If, as I said earlier, if um, you feel lonely and you see someone else hurt, instead of engaging in all that empathy that you could engage in, you're worried about yourself. You're not trying to be heartless. That's just the brain state that you and other social animals have evolved to go into. It doesn't mean we can't override it, but it's the default to go into that self-preservation mode. And so we kind of thoughtlessly are moving away so that we don't get injured any, by whatever threat is, uh, is in the environment. So we're not using those social skills. Um, the uh, third is social support. Uh, and and the, kind of the, the 
story to show why that isn't very effective is think about a patient in the hospital. They can press a button and they have all the appraisal, tangible, uh, uh, emotional support they can ask for. It's just that's not the person who they want that emotional support. And so the patients in hospitals tend to feel quite lonely despite all the dimensions of social support being covered for them. The nurses want to be there, they want to assist, they want to provide the emotional support, but it, it's like having your loved ones away if you know having someone else there just isn't a replacement. So social support doesn't work very well. Now of the three I've mentioned, that works better than the other two, but it's really very, very low effect side. The one that seems to work is social cognitive therapy, reappraising how people think about other people. If you're, like I mentioned, you can override it if you know that you're not being empathic and you're not being empathic because your brain goes into the self-preservation mode. An awareness of that allows you to say, wait, let me look at this situation and see what they need. So that has to be trained, though, because it's not going to be the default state for a person who feels lonely. And so that's what the social cognitive training is about. Wonderful. We have reached our time. I very much enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to your presentation this afternoon. Thank you very Later much. Later this evening. Thank you.